Uh, welcome to a First Wednesday. I love seeing all of you guys. Prioritize prayer. It is the engine that keeps redemption running. I also want to give a special shout out to all of the redemption youth in the room. Can we honor the next gen? They typically meet here on Wednesdays, but on first Wednesdays, we gather together as a church. And right now we are doing a series that we're calling Spiritual Disciplines for Ordinary People, where we're helping all of us go deeper in our personal relationship with Jesus, growing in our discipleship together as a church. And here's the reason why we're doing this series is because by the end of this year, guess what, guys, we are going to be moving in into our new building. Come on, come on, isn't that amazing? Look, we got some pictures right up here, right here, throw a picture up, look at that. I just love seeing it, it just makes me so happy. Look at that. All of this is gonna be our next gen, and then we're gonna have a 600 seat sanctuary where we can, by God's grace, go back down to two services on a Sunday. But in the meantime, we'll be at six on Easter. Come on, praise God, right? Uh, and so here's what I know as you look at that and man, God is moving in power. He is, he, he is really the finger of God is, is happening here. We are building into a movement of every man, woman, and child experiencing life change through Jesus. But what I always tell us as a church is we want to focus on spiritual health, not numerical growth. And the reason we're doing the spiritual discipline series is because what are we going to do when all those people show up? And we're not spiritually ready or prepared to be able to disciple them, to lead them, to love them, to care for them, or to be the church that's there for them. Here's the way I, I put it in your notes, and I do hope you'll be taking notes tonight, is that before we grow bigger, we must go deeper. Before we grow bigger as a church, we must go deeper. People are always like, well, living things grow, and that's true, but cancer grows, and that's not always a good thing, right? Right? Right, your waistline grows, you don't like that, do you? <laughs> Just because something grows doesn't automatically mean it is good growth. We wanna grow our church in a way that glorifies God, that is honoring to him, and so we're focusing on our spiritual disciplines because we don't wanna just grow bigger, we wanna grow healthier, we wanna grow stronger, we wanna grow holier, and we wanna grow in a way that glorifies God so that way we can be a blessing to the city around us because people are gonna come and we wanna be ready, we wanna be prepared, and we wanna be the healthiest church that we could be so that way we can love them and serve them in a way that God would have us to. And so we're doing the spiritual disciplines. We started off this series in January with the subject of fasting. Anybody like fasting? And I'm not talking about fast food. I'm talking about fasting from food. We spent 21 days fasting. Um, last month, we did the spiritual discipline of Bible study. And together, we read through the four gospels in 31 days. And we gave you tools to where you could dive in and interpret the scripture for yourself. Next month, we're going to be doing the discipline of prayer and how we build a prayer life. But today, we're going to be talking about one of the more forgotten, overlooked, and um, often misunderstood spiritual disciplines, and it's stewardship. What is stewardship? Stewardship is how we manage God's money. Stewardship is a principle that's found all throughout the scriptures, and it's very important. People oftentimes wonder, why do churches talk about money? I'll, I'll tell you why we talk about money, because the Bible talks about money. You know, how many of you think prayer is important? Anybody think prayer as a discipline is important? Well, here you go. Um, prayer is mentioned 371 times in your Bible. That's a lot. It means we should, we should pray. Who thinks faith is important? It's how we're saved by grace through faith. Anybody think having faith in God, building your faith is important? Faith is mentioned 245 times. What about repentance? Repentance is important. It's how we change the direction of our lives, and then the Lord begins to restore and heal and save us. Anybody think repentance is important? First words out of Jesus' mouth, repent and believe the kingdom of God is at hand. Repentance is mentioned 75 times. And then the subject of money or stewardship, finances, is mentioned 2,350 times in your Bible. It's a, it's a really big theme. And it's not because it's important to God, but oftentimes because it's one of the most important things to us. 
See, money, it can produce what only God can provide. Money tells you, I can be your security. No, that's God's job. Money says, I can be your identity. No, that's, that's God's job. I can, I can be safety. No, that's God's job. See, money promises what only God can provide. And so God speaks about money because so many of us, we struggle or we fear or we build our lives or we, we say, this is the one part that I'm not yet ready to fully surrender over to you. And when Jesus died for us, he didn't die for part of us or some of us. He came for all of us. And that includes the way we view and steward and the way we invest the dollars and days that God has trusted us. That's what stewardship is. And so we are in uh, a series right now called Multiply, and we're talking about the subject of generosity and stewardship. Oftentimes you'll hear the sermons on generosity. Hey, it is more blessed to give than it is to receive. Re- bring to the Lord the full tithe so that you know heaven might be opened over your life, right? We hear these verses about God loving a cheerful giver, and so we hear messages around the subject of giving. But that's only one part of biblical finances. The other part is stewardship. I want you to think it like this. Think about it like a bicycle, that you need two pedals to go in the same direction, right? Well, if you don't have it, you're going to be going in circles. So stewardship and generosity are like two pedals on the bike. It's not only what we give, but it's also what we keep. That God doesn't just bless what we give, God also blesses what we keep. And so we want both pedals of stewardship and generosity moving in the same direction so we can experience God's favor and blessings upon our lives. How do we do that? Well, we studied it last week when we were in our Multiply series in 2 Corinthians. We want to be like the Macedonians. The Macedonians, though they were poor, they were overflowing with generosity. How did they do that? Well, here's how they did it. It was a very simple strategy. They put God first, and then they gave to the Lord. They gave first to the Lord and then they gave also to the church. The way that we said it was like this. When you put God first, the rest is blessed. When you put God first in any area of your life, let's say you put God first in your marriage, God's going to bless your marriage. Put God first in your home. Watch what God does in the life of your kids. Put God first in your job and watch what God does in the workplace environment that you're in. Put God first when it comes to your mental health and and watch how you're gonna see peace in your life and experience the joy of the Lord that will be your strength. Put God first and watch him bless the rest. And it's true in every area. It's especially true in this area that we wanna put God first, not only in what we give, but we wanna put God first and be conscious and be intentional about what we keep and the way that we save, invest, and the way that we steward God's resources. And so if you have your Bible, we're going to be in 2 Corinthians chapter 8. We're going to be continuing our study in the spiritual disciplines and in multiply at the same time. Anybody like a good deal? You like the buy one, get one, which is you know, basically free, right? Well, today you're going to get a buy one, get one sermon because it's spiritual disciplines and multiply all combined into one. There you go. It's free. All right, here we go. What we see is four statements on good stewardship that we can apply to our lives. The first is this. You need to know that stewardship starts in the heart. Look what Paul says. But thanks be to God. Do you thank God for giving sermons? If you were a Macedonian, you would. Do you praise God for the opportunity to be generous? Do you praise God for the opportunity to steward and invest with wisdom? He says, thanks be to God who put this into our hearts of Titus for the same reason that I, that I care. Let me explain to you first what a steward is. We don't use the word steward very often in our vernacular, right? I mean, we don't, we don't like really talk about the subject of steward. But here's what a steward is. A steward is a manager. So anybody have any financial advisors, maybe a 401k, Roth IRA, and some investments? Anybody in the room? Okay, good. So what we do is uh, you give some money to a financial adv- advisor, and then they manage your money for you. Is that his money? It's not his money. He, he's the manager. Or let's say uh, maybe you're a college student, right? And you're going out of town. You have a friend who's going out of town. They let you live in their house for a weekend. You walk their dog, and you can eat anything in the fridge. (laughs) That's a good deal, isn't it? Now, when they come home, is that your house? You're going to have to give them back the keys, right? (laughs) Why? Because you're just the manager. They're the owner. When it comes to a Christian view of finances, 
is we recognize that God is the owner of everything. And God has graciously entrusted us with his resources. They're not ours, they're his. Everything we have is a gift that comes from him. And so he shares with us, but he entrusts it so that way we can be wise and get a good return on the investment. Here's the way I say it like this. Everything I own is on loan. Everything I own, I don't actually own. It's all loaned to me by God in the way that I save and invest and steward those things is a representative of my love and my compassion and my care for what God has entrusted me with. You don't own anything. You know how I know that you don't actually own anything? Because you came in this world without it and you're gonna leave without it too. Because you can't take it with you. J.D. Rockefeller, the richest man who's ever lived in America, when he died, they asked his accountant, how much money did Rockefeller leave behind? And you know what he said? All of it. Because you can't take it with you because it doesn't belong to you. The Bible says, the silver is gold, the silver is mine, and the gold is mine, thus saith the Lord. The Bible says that he owns the cattle on a thousand hills. Colossians says that by him, to him, for him, through him, all things are held together. He is sovereign over all, and he entrusts it to us. Everything you own is on loan. And this creates an attitude of gratitude in your heart because you recognize that it's not yours, and so there's no reason for you to be stressed because you've been so blessed. You get so stressed about money because you think it's yours. But when you recognize it's a gift that God has given to you, you're going to move from stress to blessed because you're practicing the habit and the discipline of good biblical stewardship. Everything you own is a gift. So think about it. When you go to your house, say, thank you, Jesus, for letting me live in your house. When you go back to the college, say, thank you, Jesus, for letting me live at these dorms. Your dorms, Jesus. Whenever you go out to eat and you're after church and you're getting the enchilada at a Tex-Mex restaurant, you say, thank you, Jesus, for letting me eat your enchiladas. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Pass the Cholula, right? (laughs) It all belongs to him. And he's sharing it with you. Everything you own is on loan from God. God is the owner and we are the manager. Stewardship starts right here. It's not about what's in your wallet. It's about what's in your heart. The second thing we see is that stewardship requires leadership. Look what he says. He's talking about taking up this offering, and he says, with him, that's Titus, we are sending the brother who is famous among all the churches for his preaching of the gospel. And not only that, but he has also been appointed by the churches to travel with us as we carry out this act of grace. He's talking about raising up funds for a special offering that is being ministered by us for the glory of the Lord himself and to show our good will. Here, Paul mentions two early church leaders. One, that he doesn't mention my name, but two, another pastor named named Titus. And he's sending them ahead and he's entrusting this act of grace, this generosity initiative that they're on. He's entrusting it to these two leaders so that way they can steward it well. The principle here is that, that anytime you want to practice wisdom with your finances, it's not going to happen by accident. It happens with good leadership. Like you have to exercise leadership of your finances. I'll I'll show you what Jesus means when he says this. No man can serve two masters. You will love one or hate the other. No man can serve both God and money. Jesus calls money a master. Do you know why? Because if you don't master your money, your money will master you. you. You have to learn how to lead it. How many of you get paid on Friday and you're like, I'm rich. And then Monday comes along and you're like, I'm broke. Does that ever happen? Okay, you don't have to raise your hand. We'll do an altar call later. (laughs) And you're often wondering, where did my money go? Where did it go? You ever like get your statement at the end and you're like, I went to Chick-fil-A four times last week. I know it's the Lord's chicken, but golly, right? (laughs) And you're often wondering like, where did my money go? Do you know why you're wondering where your money went? Because you never told it where to go. Listen, if you never tell your money where to go, you're always going to be wondering where your money went. This is why you have to practice good leadership. It doesn't happen by accident. I've never met anybody who accidentally worked their way into a new tax bracket. I've never met anybody who accidentally had money left over. No, it all comes with an intentionality. It comes with 
discipline, it comes with hard work if we want to be able to be good stewards. You've got you to exercise good leadership. And if you don't, then you're going to be wondering where it went instead of actually being able to tell your money where to go. And this is why um, I want to give you a, a big theological word, okay? So every week at Redemption, I try to give you a big theological word. Last week, it was hermeneutics. That's the understanding and the interpretation and application of the Bible to our everyday lives. And then this week, I have another big word. It's called sanctification. It's the process of becoming like Jesus. But I got a big word for you today. It's a very religious, very holy word, okay? It starts with a B, and it rhymes with nugget. It's a budget. It's a budget. Get on a budget. And some of you are looking at me right now. You're like, Byron, this is not very spiritual. You're like, oh, man, I don't understand. I wanted to go deep in my discipleship, right? But listen, it's always a spiritual issue before it ever is a financial issue. Because here's what Jesus says. No man builds a house unless he first counts the cost. What is Jesus saying? Get on a budget. And so if Jesus would have recommended being on a budget, then how much more should we take Jesus' advice and live our lives based upon a budget? Because we want to honor God with our wealth. And foolishness is not honoring to God. It is not glorifying to God when we are not wise. And so we want to be wise with our, our money. And so let me give you, if I were to start over my life and I was a young 20-year-old and I was trying to build for the future and envisioning, here's the way that I would, um, I would set up a, a budget for myself. Number, number one is I would tithe. I, I want to put God first in every area of my life. And so first and foremost, I, I give to God first. He is the, the first thing. Before, uh, before the mortgage comes out, before the credit card bills are due, before the, the water bill is due, I want to give God his due. And so I put God first in every area of my life, including my finances. I start with tithing. Uh, for me and Ashley, we do 10% is a good standard rule. The, the second thing is I want to save 10%. I want to not only give to God, but I want to give to my future. And so I'm going to invest 10% of my paycheck into my future. Uh, then three, mortgage. Now, a lot of people right now are living house broke. It means they took out too big of a mortgage and they're struggling to be able to pay it off because they're not acting their wage. You know, you ever hear that saying, act your age? People aren't acting their wage. They're trying to spend money they don't have to impress people they don't even know. So a good rule of thumb is that your mortgage or rent is not more than 25% of your annual income. So you want to keep it there. That leaves 50% left over for all of your expenses. And then there's 5% that is remaining for you to go have fun. You know, God's cool with you having fun. God, God loves to see his kids laugh. He don't mind if you go on vacation to see his beautiful creation. He doesn't mind if you wear nice clothes and you drive a good car. What he does mind is if you put fun ahead of your faith. That's what the problem is. And that's why many of us struggle. It's because we think more about ourselves than we think about Jesus and others. And if you want to truly experience joy, I'll tell you how it's spelled. Do you know how to spell joy? Jesus, others, self. Right? Jesus, others, yourself. Put God first. Take care of your family and all of your responsibilities. And then there's enough left over for you to be able to go out and have a little bit of fun. Here's what I said. Is that you want to prioritize what is important in your life. How important is God to you? He should be the, the most important. And so we want to prioritize God first in everything that we do. This is why budgeting is so important, because we are prioritizing God. We're putting it on paper. We're writing it down. We're sticking to it. We're living by it. We are prioritizing what is important in our lives. We prioritize time with our families. We prioritize our time with our spouses. We, we prioritize our, our personal time, our, our quiet time. We also need to prioritize what is important. Jesus says, where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Do you want to know what's important to you? Then check your bank statements. And you'll be able to find what things are most important to you. Is it comfort? Is it ease? Is it, you know, um, is, is it fashion style? Is it survival? Whatever it is, because some of us, that's what is very important, is just being able to survive. But what we put God first, what we see is that the rest is blessed. And so we want to prioritize God above everything. And so that's why it takes good leadership and it's self-leadership. You've got to lead yourself. We've got to exercise the discipline of good stewardship. And it is a discipline. And you don't get good at it overnight. You don't start as an expert. Like nobody just hears a great sermon and automatically becomes Dave Ramsey. No, 
we have to develop a skill and we have to grow in this area of, of leadership. That's, that's the second thing, is that he entrusts it to you. He's trusting you with his resources. The third thing we learn is that stewardship, it demands accountability. Now, I know what some of you are thinking. You're like, okay, Byron, this is a little convicting, not too much, but just a little convicting. <clears throat> um, but what about you? What about the church? Well, what I always say is that everything rises and falls on leadership. And I can't ask you to do something that I don't do myself. And so let me take the burden off of you and let me put the pressure back here at the church. So when we teach on the subject of giving and stewardship and generosity, a lot of times people get really defensive a bit. They're like, well, before I give, I, 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 wanna, I, I wanna know some things too. Before I trust you, I, I, wanna, I wanna have some answers and some questions. See, there's a lot of reasons why people don't give to churches. Maybe one is because they're not Christians. We don't expect non-Christians to give, okay? This is all our gift to you. If you're a non-Christian, welcome, we love you. Church is for you. We do it for you. Some people don't give because they're not yet sure if they're ready to be a part of the church, and so they wanna wait until they do that. Some people don't give because, well, they have yet to surrender that area of their life to the Lordship of Jesus. And then some people, they struggle with the concept of, of giving because they don't know if they can trust the leadership. Are we making sure that the church is stewarding and budgeting and, and are they asking me to do something that we're not willing to do ourselves? So I, I believe in something called tithing and me and Ashley, we practice that in our lives. But did you know that this church tithes? So every dollar that goes in, 10% goes back out into world missions or into local global. In fact, there is a, um, there's a financial review that is in your guidebook. If you didn't get it, you can actually go out to the lobby right now and you could grab one of these. This is our finances for the entire year of 2023. We have it broken down, it's available for you. You can see all the different areas in which income and outgoing, you could see what came in. And so we provide this every year for people who are in our church or anybody can just go out there and grab one. It's a financial review because here's what we know is that transparency is the currency of trust. We, we want you to be able to trust that your leaders are living in a way that is godly and that we are, we are growing and we are working and we are striving and we are moving in this direction because transparency is the currency of trust. We want you to be able to trust. And so let me just share briefly a little bit about what we do here because here he's, he's talking about, um, we take this course so that no one should blame us about the generous gift that is being administered by us. We aim that we are doing what is honorable, not only in the Lord's sight, but also in the sight of man. And with them, we're sending our brother whom we've tested and we found earnest in many matters who is now earnest than ever because of this great confidence in you. As for Titus, my partner, my fellow worker for your benefit and as our brothers and messengers of the churches and the glory of Christ. One of the reasons we, we give to the church is because the church is the glory of Christ. People often ask, well, well where should I give? Can I give to Air One? Can I give to the March of Dimes? Is that still considered tithing? Is it considered tithing if I give my money to UNICEF or whatever other nonprofit you know, organization? Those things could be good things, great things, but they are not the glory of Christ. We give to the church because the church is the glory of Christ. It's the bride of Christ, what Jesus is coming back for. And so we give to the church first to the Lord and then to the us. And then what's left over, we give to support many various causes. But the glory of Christ is the local church. And so let me share with you a little bit of this transparency for, for how we operate here at, at Redemption. Um, one time early in the church, somebody said, uh, I don't give to the church because you and Ashley just keep all the money. I wish, that would be amazing. <laughs> like, I would plant a church from prison on the inside, right? <laughs> prison ministry, <laughs> redemption. No, we don't actually touch any of that. In fact, we have a board of elders, overseers, and trustees, three boards. So there's three pastors who are above me that I report to. They're my pastors. And they have the authority to be able to discipline or to be able to uh, set our budgets and salaries, all that stuff. I don't even set that. So me and Ashley's salary is set by an external board. 
Then we have elders and trustees. Elders lead and govern in the internal workings of the church. Trustees manage all the finances. Every month, there's an expense report sent over to the trustees. The trustees validate it, send it back. It's sent off to our board. We have an HR, and we have an accountant that manages all the resources. And so no staff member, myself nor Ashley included, touch any of the money that ever comes into redemption because we want to be very transparent because we want to be very trusting right? And so I also have to take off my shoes to count to 20. You don't want me to touch any money, right? (laughs) But that's the way that we we operate because we want to be able to say we honored God, that we want to honor God when it comes to the wealth. That's what Proverbs says this, honor the Lord with your wealth and the first fruits of your produce. Honor the Lord with your wealth. You know why Paul talks about honoring and stewardship being honoring and Proverbs talks about it? Because when you honor God, God honors you. When you honor God, God honors you. When you put God first, man, God's going to pour out blessings upon your life. When you're a good steward, God's going to give you more opportunities to be a good steward. Here's what Jesus says. Those who are faithful with little will be faithful with much. And so we want to honor God in every area of our lives, especially this area. We want to put God first in every area of our lives, especially this area, because when we honor God, God in return honors us. This is stewardship. Let me give you an example, Um, just a little illustration. Let's say I am having small group coming up, and we need to get some some food for small group. Anybody ready for small group starting this week? Come on, let's go. And so I, I, I'm going to buy for the whole small group. And so I, I asked Trevor, I'm really busy in sermon prep, and Ashley's, you know, wrestling with the girls. Can you go to HEB, and here's $100, and buy um, all the food for small group tonight? And I give him $100. And then Trevor comes back, and he has a Nintendo Switch and some sunglasses, and he's eating a corn dog, and he's got a full tank of gas. And I go, Trevor, where's, where's the food for small group? He said, oh, you know, PB, after I bought all this cool stuff, I didn't have enough money left over. And so you know what I would do to Trevor? I would fire him. <laughs> so then I'm going to go over to Ameris, and I'm going to say, hey, Ameris, um, here's $100. Could you go to the store and get groceries for our small group? And then she comes back, and she says, here you go. I got you everything that you asked for, and... I used a coupon, and I saved you some money. Here's $20 back. You know what I'm going to do? I'm going to give her Trevor's job. (laughs) Do you know why? Because she was faithful in stewarding my money. This is what God does for good stewards. He trusts you with a little, and then he'll trust you with more because you honored him. God, in return, is going to honor you. Listen, God wants to bless you. God wants to open up heaven over your life. God wants to pour out his favor on your life. But for some of us, the reason why he is not doing it is because we are, we are not honoring him. And when you put God first, the rest is blessed. And when you honor God, God in return honors you. The fourth and the final thing as we kind of wrap this up is this, is stewardship enables generosity. I know many people, I've never met anybody who says, I don't want to be generous. I haven't met them, at least not in the church. I mean, I believe as Christians, the spirit of God inside us desires for to be generous. Like we, we want to be generous. We wish we could be more generous. Like we want to give more. But for some of us, the reason that we struggle with that is because, well, we don't know how. How am I going to make it work? I want to be more generous. You have the want to, but you don't have the how to. And that's why stewardship is so important in prioritizing God because what you'll learn is when you put God first, the rest is blessed, and there's always more left over. Because you're not giving to God last, you're putting God first, you're able to become more generous. And so good stewardship enables generosity over your life. Here's what it says. It says, so give proof before the churches of your love and of our boasting about these men. So he says that, that good stewardship is a way in which you can love the church in a stronger and better way. He says that stewardship is actually proof of your love for the church. And as you learn to steward, here's what's gonna happen, is that you're gonna get better with your income, and the better you get with your income, the more income you're gonna make, and the more income you make, you're gonna be presented with a a question. Because you're faithful with a little, you're gonna be faithful with more. You learn to steward, your stewardship increases, you're gonna be forced with a choice. And every single one of us has to make this choice. Are you going to give more or spend more? That's the choice. The more you make, you have a choice. Will I spend it or will I give it? 
See, many people think if I had more money, then I would be more generous. But that's actually not true. I mean, the theologian Biggie Small says, mo money, mo problems, right? <laughs> because money fuels temptation. Because the more money you make, the more tempted you will be to spend it on yourself. And so we're all forced with the decision. Do we spend it or do we give it? And I want you to understand something is that God, he wants to bless you. God wants to see you be successful. God wants you to take that next level and that step. But listen, God does not raise your standard of living. He raises your standard of giving. God blesses us, not so that way we can be blessed, but that way we can be a blessing to others. God doesn't raise your standard of living so you can spend it on yourself. He doesn't mind it as long as you have everything in the right order. He doesn't raise your standard of living. He desires to raise your standard of giving. And we all have a choice. When we get older, after you graduate college and you land a good job, if you learn this discipline in your life now, you are going to be so much further along than anybody else your age because you have put God first at a young age and God's going to continue to bless you 40, 50, 60 years into the future. Because God doesn't just raise our standard of living, he raises our standard of giving. So I'll show you a little illustration to, to work this out. And it's spiritual disciplines for ordinary people. So I, I want to help make this super simple for all of us. We all got to start somewhere. Like I, I go to the gym, and when I'm working out, um, I, I first started, I could, I could only do 25s on each side. I know you're thinking, no, he's so weak, right? I couldn't tell through this sweatshirt, right? <laughs> but then after a while, I was able to move up to 35s. And then, I'm, and then 45s, and then and I had a whole plate, and then I started adding more and more. And over the course of the last three years, I've gotten stronger. Just like any other discipline, you don't automatically become excellent at it overnight. It takes work, it takes dedication, it takes discipline. So for some people, this is where you find yourself at. You, you, you've, you've never given before. Right? You, you've, you've never considered that. And so you would start here as an, an initial giver. Right? You know what? You're like, I, I've given zero but I'm going to start giving, and so I'm going, to, I'm going to give five, ten, maybe twenty dollars a week. And then God's pleased with that because it's your first step in learning to be a steward. He's cool with that. He's good. But you learn to trust him. Maybe you move up into this next area, and this is a consistent giver. So now you're not giving sporadically or emotionally, but you're giving consistently. And this is honoring to God because now it's a habit, and then you move up to this area, which is a percentage giver. This would be like the tithe, 10%. But some of us, we aren't ready to start there, so we can start at five, seven. Pick a number, led by the Spirit, and then work your way to the 10%. That's how I learned to tithe. But this is just the beginning, because there's always more in store for those who trust God. And so it moves you up to what is a progressive giver, which is where me and Ashley are at today. We set a goal to outgive ourselves every year. That's our goal. And so for the last 10 years, it's been a race to see if we can give more every year. And so we always try, when we get our giving statement, to be able to see, did we give more this year than last year? Because we want to increase, we want to go beyond. And then that leads to this area, which is a lifetime giver. Here's a story of a man in our church for Multiply. He graduated college in 1985, and he's a, he's a doctor. And he made a prayer to God. He said, God, I would love to give a $100,000 gift one day. And for the last 30 years, not about, on his normal tithe, he has been putting money aside for 30 years, saving just for this one specific reason, to give it away. And after 30 years, he came to our church. And he said that in a worship service, the Lord said, this is the church I want you to give that 100,000 to. And the reason why we're able to do multiply and where we're at today and how far we've come is because he sowed in faith a lifetime gift that he has been stewarding for 30 years. What would it look like for the college kids here to make a very similar decision? Say, I'm, I'm not going to set income goals. I'm going to set giving goals. 
And when you graduate, you, you pray a bold prayer. You say, God, I would love to one day be able to write a check for more money than I make in a year. And then you're faithful in stewarding it when it's little, and God continues to trust you even greater over time. God doesn't just raise our standard of living. What God wants to do is he wants to raise our standard of giving. And and we gotta understand that this is discipleship. Because Jesus says it like this. When Jesus is telling a parable, he explains it by saying in Matthew 25, 21, the master said to him, well done, good and faithful servant. You know that verse? Do you know what that verse is referring to? Stewardship. There was men who buried their talents, and then there was men who invested their talents. And the one who did just buried the talent, wasted it. The master came and cursed him. But the ones who invested it, the master comes along and says, well done, good and faithful servant. Maybe we could say it like this, well done, good and faithful steward. You've been faithful over little. I will now set you over much. Enter into the joy of your master. Stewardship is discipleship because we're learning to trust God in every area of our lives, especially in this area. Stewardship is discipleship. We're faithful with a little. God will entrust us with much more. In a moment, we're gonna open up the altars and we're gonna begin praying for people. And I, I feel that we should start by praying for people's finances because I know there's people in our church who you're struggling. Like every week it's a decision. Do I put gas in my car so I can go to church or buy groceries for my kids? There's others of you, you're working a job where you're underpaid and you've been there for years and you're praying, God, would you give me an increase? There's others in this room who you are drowning in debt and you wanna be free. And I believe that there is a breakthrough that is available for us when it comes to our finances. I, I want to tell a story um, of what God can do in that. Um, is my phone over here? Yeah, I want to read you a text from a, a single mom in our church. And I just want this to, to build your faith. So if the band could go ahead and start playing. I got a text this week from a single mom, or last week. And so for a year, she's, she's made a multiply pledge. And every single week, she, she gives about $20 a week. She's been faithful for this whole time, $20. Listen, it's not about the size of the gift, it's about the heart of the giver. She's been faithful, but she's been struggling. And she's a single mom taking care of two beautiful girls. And the Christmas holidays were coming up. And there's a, another woman in our church who she came up to me after a service and she said, Byron, the Lord put it on my heart for me to give um, $2,000 to the church. But I want you to break it up into gifts for single moms. And so one person being obedient to Jesus gave a $2,000 gift, broke it up, and was able to bless four single moms with $500 for Christmas. And she was the first one I thought about. I was like, yes, and then another one, and another one. I knew exactly who I, who I wanted to get that money to. And so I went up to her, and I, I pulled her to the side. and said, hey, this is for you. And she broke down crying because it's been a really hard year. And she struggles with depression, and she's overcome addiction in her life. And she told me that she had thought about actually giving up, taking her life, or running away and abandoning, because it's just so hard. And then the Lord met her right in that moment where she was at her deepest moments of depression and despair and said, here's a gift. That's what generosity does. And then she texted me last week and here's what she said. She said, I have just been approved for childcare assistance after waiting for 25 months. I am now saving over $1,000 a month just wanted to share the breakthrough. So if you are in a place where you want to trust God and put him first in your life, and you're believing God, I need a breakthrough, God. I, I, I wanna honor you financially. I wanna honor you with my wealth, God. I need you to show up in my finances in my life, Lord Jesus. As a church, could we just stand together? 
And I just want you, I just want to, I just want you to slip your hand up. I want, I want to, I want to pray over you. If you're here and you're like, I need breakthrough in my life. I need breakthrough. I need breakthrough. Look around, look around the room. I need breakthrough. I need breakthrough. I need, I need your, you to move in my life right now, God. I just begin to pray over each and every one of these people, God, that you would bring breakthrough in their life, God. That there would be jobs for the kingdom, God. That there would be increase in finances for the kingdom, not to raise their standard of living so much as it is for the standard of giving that you have placed upon them, God. We are just praying in your name, Lord, that, you, that, that we will honor you with our wealth. And as we honor you, you honor us in return, God. And we're trusting you, Father. Lord, we're praying for answers to prayers. You know the hearts, you know the desires, you know the needs, Lord. And so I am believing in faith that you will begin to unleash a move in people's lives. You know, we struggle when it comes to... Um, to, to, to receiving blessings of, of finances. Jesus says it's more blessed to give than it's to receive, but it's also really blessed to get to receive, isn't it? And we often have this really negative mindset around money. Like, like whenever somebody compliments like your jacket, what do, you, what do you say? Like, hey, that's a really nice jacket. What do you say? Oh, this thing, I got it on sale, right? Because money makes us feel weird, doesn't it? And so somebody says, oh, hey, I really like your shoes. You're like, oh, what? No, man, I mean, these are really old, right? They were a gift, right? Somebody says, I like your car. You're like, well, it was used. You wouldn't say that about other things. Hey, your wife's really nice. Oh, that old hag? No, I'll just get it, right? <laughs> she wasn't my first choice, right? I love you, Ashley. You, see, I'm trying to show you how ridiculous it sounds for you to be embarrassed around finances. Right? So if it's an area of our, our trusting God, it's an area of blessings. God has blessed me with a beautiful wife. But, but he's, also, he's also blessed us with a good life. When we put him first, the rest is blessed. And so if, if you're in a place where you need to receive, I want you to ask you one more time. Slip your hand up. Father God, I thank you for this man, his wife. I thank you for her and her and her and her, God. They want to put you first and the rest is blessed. So God, would you just begin to build their faith and their trust as they step out and they give you their lives. In Jesus' name, amen.